Well, warm welcome to today's video. Today we're going to be talking about a treatment which a large-scale study and many large-scale studies have shown is safe and effective, reducing the chances of getting infected with COVID-19 and we believe other viruses from other studies as well by 20 to 28 percent, and reducing the chances of death in those infected with COVID-19 by 33 percent. And there are other studies show that this treatment is probably effective against a wide range of viruses we're talking about vitamin d an efficacious safe and effective treatment now of course we want to talk about the data so we're going to be looking at this paper here uh, this is from scientific reports it's part of the nature group this is the whole study here obviously you get the, you can download the pdf i'll give the link of course so let's get straight down to it Scientific reports from the journal Nature, very prestigious journal. Association between vitamin D supplementation, COVID-19 infection and mortality. Now, the authors here are uh, attending uh, or work in universities such as Johns Hopkins University of Michigan, National Bureau of Economic Research, University of Chicago, Veterans Affair, all very prestigious stuff. And in the paper, they say this uh, vitamin D deficiency is associated with reduced immune function. Basically, that's not a point for discussion. They just state that. And the re deficiency can lead to viral infection, COVID and other viruses. Now, as winter comes along, we're exposed to all sorts of viruses. So personally, I'm taking 4,000 units of vitamin D a day uh, with some vitamin K2, 100 micrograms of vitamin K2, and intend to do so until I get some sunshine. <laughs> so um, basically all winter, I plan to take that uh, amount um, good to get your levels checked if your doctor will do it. Unfortunately, uh, I'm having difficulty getting mine to do it. Um, vitamin D deficiency associated with increased risk of COVID-19. But what about a treatment and what about prognosis? Well, to be fair, to, to look at a, a treatment, this is the problem here. To, to work out whether a treatment's efficacious, we, we need the random double-blind controlled trials. But this does tell us quite a lot about the prognosis. Why is no one doing randomised double-blind control trials on vitamin D? Um, could it be because you can't make any money out of it, because it's not patentable, because you can get it anywhere? A cynic, a cynic might think so. Uh, popular, this is the population of US veterans, veterans, and they give them D2 and D3. Now, you get a lot of questions on the difference between D2 and D3. Basically, most of the evidence shows that you can metabolize D3 more quickly, but vitamin D2 can also be metabolized. So my supplement's D3, but it probably doesn't make too much difference. When your sun is exposed to ultraviolet light, it makes D3. D2 tends to come from mushrooms. So personally, I take D3, um, and we are actually will see that D3 is probably slightly better um, in a minute. But, but, but both are probably efficacious, but personally, D3 is the one to probably to go for. Association and reductions of infections. Now, after applying all restrictions, the numbers here, they had um, 223,000 people supplemented with the vitamin D. Great number. Um, that was D3. 34,000 um, supplemented with D2, also fine. And uh, 400,000 untreated patients. So they've got a nice big study group. So that's the D3 study group there. That's the controls there fantastic size you can compare data from those data with those and get some pretty significant results retrospective cohort study looking back at large cohorts for whom data was available people that supplemented before and during the pandemic versus untreated controls one-to-one -one matches very nice piece of statistics by their statisticians to do this and the treatments that were given the d2 d3 and the activated form calcifidiol now, basically, it takes a couple of weeks for the liver to fully metabolize vitamin D that we take. So you're not going to get full benefits unless you take calcifidiol early. So this is very much about a prevention and preventing uh, increasing severity of disease and preventing death. But best to take it before you get the infection as a long term uh, sort of treatment is, is the best. The best thing to do a long term supplement if you're not getting the sun, which most of us don't. Um, now, D3 co uh, so this, sorry, Veterans Administration, a corporate data warehouse is where this came from. So they've got lots and lots of data there and the data was available. And, and again, they're saying a couple of months to get full response, a couple of weeks to get a good response. But this is something we need to be taking longer term over winter when we are simply not producing it in the sun, at least where I live, you certainly don't produce any. 
and uh, not much prospect of it producing it in the north of England in the immediate future. Well, the next six or seven months, really. D3 cohort, COVID-19 rates uh, for the treated group, uh, 2.66% of those followed up. A COVID-19 rates for the untreated group, 3.3%, very large numbers. Remember, we're talking about a couple hundred thousand people here. So nice reduction. D3, 20% reduction in infections. D2, 28% reduction in infections. This doesn't mean D2 is better because, as we'll see in a minute, D3 is better at preventing death. And I think we can basically say we're in the 20s of percents there for both. So both pretty effective. But uh, D3 is the one we normally take. But mortality, interesting. Infections ending in mortality within 30 days. Uh, the D3 group treated uh, the fatality rate there was 0.23%, untreated 0.35%. That means vitamin D is associated with a, a 33% mortality reduction. Uh, that's a hazard ratio of 67%. So yes, 67%. Uh, you're less likely to get it compared to 100% if you're not treated. So 33% reduction in mortality rate. Quest, my question is, why aren't the Prime Minister and the Chief Scientific Officer and the Chief Medical Officer standing side by side on the television telling people to take this safe and effective treatment that costs essentially nothing? According to this article here from uh, these prestigious medical academics all over the United States because we want it to be safe and effective. Let's go on probability that this so p equals 0 0.001 only one chance in a thousand this arose by chance this is a uh, very significant result why is this not being taken up and shouted about all over the place very strange i mean other treatments and preventative strategies are being well publicized uh, this one is not it's up to you to publicize this um Vitamin D to 25% lower, apparently, but th that wasn't a significant result. So this, the D3, which shows the significant reduction in um, the likelihood of dying for people that have the infections. Now, veterans who received higher doses of vitamin D obtain greater benefits from supplementation than veterans receiving lower dose. In other words, there is a dose-specific uh, dose response. People on higher doses did better. And of course, the people that did the worst were those on the lowest doses, and the people that got the greatest benefit were on the lowest doses. So in other words, some vitamin D is one heck of a lot better than no vitamin D over winter, uh, we could argue from this study. And uh, I'll argue pretty convincingly in my view. So vitamin D levels, the lowest, 0 to 19 nanograms per mil, did worst. But they exhibited the largest increase, the large side of the largest decrease in COVID-19 infection and mortality. They had the biggest increase in benefit because they had most decrease in infection and mortality following supplementation. So this is particularly important. It's important for everyone, but it's particularly important on those with the lowest levels of vitamin D. D, and we'll be looking at some of those people uh, shortly, who those people are. Um, now, they looked at different uh, blood levels, 0 to 19 nanograms per mil, 20 to 39 and over 40. If you want that in, in the English unit, the English unit is um, micromoles per litre. Uh, you just multiply those figures by 2.5. And they also found retrospectively they had people taking 20 units, 40 units, as you can see, all different 250 units, 1,000 units, 5,000 units, 8,000 units and 50,000 units a day. So they had the full spread of people that were supplementing over these 400,000 or so individuals that qualified for the study. This is an impressive piece of work. I I'm completely convinced by this. Black veterans received greatest association uh, COVID-19 risk reductions. And I think you know why that is now. Dark coloured skin produces vitamin D more slowly. People with dark coloured skins, at least in the United States, have, lo well, and, and everywhere, really, mo virtually everywhere, have lower levels of vitamin D because they don't make the sun, uh, in the sunshine, they don't make the vitamin D as quickly. They would need more body surface area skin exposed for longer to make the same amount. So particularly important for black veterans in the United States to consider vitamin D supplementation to reduce the risk of this and from other studies we know other viral infections. 
So white veterans would make a little more vitamin D, so the black veterans benefited most. And direct quote, uh, as a safe, widely available and affordable treatment, vitamin D may help to reduce the severity of the COVID-19 pandemic. Simple statement from the authors. And as I keep saying, we know from other studies that this is effective against other respiratory viruses. Now, is it effective against other viruses all over the body? I think there's good evidence that it could be because vitamin D receptors are in all of the white blood cells. So there's a whole range of white blood cells that protect us from disease in different ways. Vitamin D receptors are found in all of those cells. It's an immunomodulator. So if the immune system is inadequate, it bunks it up, it increases the immune response. If the immune system is uh, overstimulated and we get the inflammatory side effects, it brings it down. It's an immunomodulator. And because of the way this is working through the white blood cells, I think this will work for all viral infections. Again, this should be tested via randomised double-blind controlled trials, but no one's doing them because there's no money in it. Uh, and uh, we need to make uh, money from randomised double-blind controlled trials. Um, strange but true, I believe. More, more background. Uh, vitamin D deficiency uh, affects half of the US population. Again, they're not arguing that. The, the authors simply state that. I mean, just think about that. Half of the population of the United States is deficient in vitamin D. Half. Simply stated as a fact by the authors. Increased rates in people with darker skins, for, unfortunately, who have done worse, as we often know in many places. Risk factors reduced on exposure. People living in high latitudes in winter or indeed low latitudes if you live in the south of New Zealand or something. Um, nursing home residents who tragically did very badly in the pandemic. Healthcare workers who work inside a lot of the time. Populations with low levels of vitamin D have also experienced high rates of COVID-19. Again, simply stated as facts. Now, they did put in our, out a new mechanism. Uh, vitamin D is needed to allow T helper cells to control uh, and uh, reduce uh, interferon gamma. Now, this interferon gamma is a cytokine produced by these T helper cells. Now, you might have heard, heard of the T helper lymphocytes because it's the T helper lymphocytes that are uh, affected by the, uh, the, the human immunodeficiency virus. And you get a deficiency of the T helper cells. They can't help the immune system. So tragically, these patients develop a wide range of infections. So you need just the right amount of this interferon gamma. Um, but the, if there's a lack of vitamin D, um, it seems that you produce too much of this and you get overstimulation because it's a pro-inflammatory cytokine. So I thought that was just interesting, uh, just a mechanism, or another mechanism, me mechanism of action. Uh, these associated reductions in risk are substantial and justify more significant exploration and confirmation using RCTs. Again, who's going to pay for them? This is particularly important given the high rates of vitamin D deficiency in the US population and COVID-19. And I would add a whole range of other uh, respiratory viral infections, which other studies show efficacy of vitamin D levels uh, against. So, um, I mean, it's, it's really hard to argue uh, against this. Extrapolation from vitamin D, if it been undone over the whole country, uh, in 2020, in 2020, there would be four million fewer cases. Of course, that's a bit misleading because, well, it's not misleading. It's just that we weren't testing in early 2020, so we're not so sure. But they're, anyway, they're saying four million fewer cases, which is accurate based on their data. And look at this: 116,000 deaths could have been avoided. Now that is definitive data, I think, because we do know for a fact there was 351,999 actual deaths in the year. This could have been prevented with this safe and effective treatment. Tragically, it wasn't. Given our findings, the absence of side effects, or the absence of severe side effects, a few people can't take vitamin D, but most people uh, are fine with it. Um, the, the widespread availability and low cost of D3, vitamin D, presents a unique opportunity. Again, direct words from the author, a unique opportunity to reduce the spread and severity of COVID-19 pandemic. So there you go. I mean, I think this is definitive and I'm, I'm not going to do, do it in detail now, but we have looked at quite a few other studies uh, that have shown this works against other respiratory viral infections. And of course, when do we produce the least vitamin D in winter? When do we get most viral infections in winter? Now, um, personally, I take some K2 with my vitamin D. Uh, the form in my vitamin D supplement is uh, called MK7, which is a form of vitamin K2. And now the supplement, uh, because I'm taking 100 micrograms per day, 
We don't actually know what the best dose is, but the reason I take 100 micrograms per day with my 4,000 units of uh, vitamin D is that if you take natto, which is the uh, fermented uh, soya beans that's eaten in huge amounts in Japan, for example, uh, 100 grams of that contains 1,000 micrograms of uh, vitamin K2, indicating that 1,000 micrograms don't seem to do natto eaters in Japan any harm. And of course, in Japan, they did very well during the pandemic and they have remarkably low rates of osteoporosis as well because what the vitamin K2 is doing, so the, the, the vitamin D will liberate some calcium. Um, if the, the calcium is just in the blood, it can go into the soft tissues like in the, uh, the arterial system causing hardening of the arteries, which of course we don't want. So what the vitamin K2 does is take the liberated calcium and it puts it into the bones where we want it and keeps it out of the soft tissues where we don't want it. It, it sequesters uh, calcium in bones and takes calcium out of tissues, which of course is a win-win situation. When you look at the huge amount of uh, morbidity uh, we have with um, osteoporosis in the West, and uh, K2, basically, but why isn't it used? Why, why is K2 not used for this extensively? Um, probably because it's not... Uh, patentable but it isn't seems a great tragedy to me so um, vitamin k2 is made from uh, bacterial activity um, we don't make it ourselves uh, animals don't make it it's bacterial uh, activity so like if a cow eats grass uh, there's bacterial activity in the cow's gut that produces the k2 that will go into the milk and cheese so always best to have grass-fed uh, meat and uh, meat milk and cheese uh, if you can get it, apart from being more humane to allow cows to uh, live in a more natural uh, environment. Cheese typically contains uh, 50 micrograms uh, per 100 grams. So to me, personally, I take 100 micrograms because it seems reasonable based on that, although larger doses from the Japanese experience would appear to be safe. But that's personal. I can't tell you what to take, but that's what I take, 100 micrograms of vitamin K2 with 4,000 uh, international units of uh, vitamin D3 is what I take personally. Sa safe and effective treatments. Now, <laughs> at the moment, <coughs> GPs in the UK are being incentivized to give COVID vaccines. If they give one during a home visit, they get £30. Uh, so if you're on a home visit, I guess you could put one in and get an extra £30. Uh, standard reimbursement uh, to what's called primary care networks, uh, which money gets past the GPs, it's £15 per shot. And of course, it doesn't take too long to give an injection, so £15 per couple of minutes work. I'm up, yeah. I wouldn't do it myself. I'm not sure uh, I would feel comfortable doing that. Um, but £15 for a procedure that you can carry out 10 times an hour, easily, I would have thought. Yeah, I'm up for that kind of money. Why aren't we incentivising GPs to go around with bottles of vitamin D3? We could give them £30 if they give a course of vitamin D3 to patients with K2 to patients at home. We could give them £15 if they do it in the GP surgery every time they give them a bottle of uh, vitamin D because we know vitamin D is safe and effective. And the new contracts, apparently the money per vaccine is going down to a mere 12.58 so okay we could lower it to lower it to 12.58 per tub of vitamin d3 given uh, out which would seem reasonable to me now um lawrence has worked me out i'm afraid i've got it i've got it here it goes this is uh, lawrence i've heard that uh, john campbell is in the pocket of big overhead projector lobby got me lawrence compromised by big overhead projector lobby and as if you need any proof that's what i'm using now to look at this rumor has it is accepted tens of dollars of under the table expenses well i don't think it quite runs into the tens but a few cents maybe anyone else noticed he always seems to have an endless supply of a4 paper and fountain pens mia cooper can't argue with that so um yeah big overhead projector lobby very important for the YouTube videos you watch, or whatever videos you watch, or wherever you get your information, to make sure they are not in the pocket of any lobby. Thank you for watching.